Hey guys, welcome to a dram of diving. Uh, we have a bunch of guests who are going to be on with us tonight. Uh, some might pop in throughout the stream. Uh, we're going to try and keep it to about an hour. Tonight we are discussing uh, how can we create some positive change in the industry? Uh, you hear a lot of people say that that uh, the business model is doesn't match what new people are looking for, new divers. And we're trying to retain new divers. Uh, we're trying to get more people involved in the sport. Uh, go ahead and post your comments in the, the chat box and we will uh, address them as they come through. Uh, just uh, some news. One, uh, we are starting the podcast. I'm downloading everything uh, as we speak, essentially, and getting a podcast going. So uh, go ahead and post your comments in there and we will bring them up and in and you will see this uh, pretty soon as a podcast once I get all about 30 episodes uploaded. So uh, we have a couple people joining us right now. Uh, we are going to bring them in one by one. Joseph Glenn. Hey, Joseph. What's up? And then Eric Fine. Hey, how's it going? Yep. Tom. Evening. Mayor. And then we got one more. Kevin down in the corner here, I believe. Oh, Kevin kind of half disappeared. I don't know where Kevin went. Kevin's a black box. So, so Kevin's a new diver, but Kevin's going to be our little black box for tonight. Um, so... What we are discussing tonight is, I think we're waiting for one or two more people and I'll put them in when they get here, but we are going to discuss how can we create some positive change in the industry. Um, as always, we are, most of us are drinking, oh, Kevin's here. Uh, most of us are drinking something in some way, shape or form. I think Joseph's left out. I'm not quite sure on that. Um, cheers all. Very nice. Mm. Mountain Dew, the real true true uh true one you're you're muted there kevin just so you know going forward all right so um the question begs what can we do um i guess joseph you are a shop owner currently so we're gonna throw it on you a little bit differently and say what changes have you made recently that you've seen um the need to make so first off uh, hello everybody um i'm joseph glenn i'm the owner of southern dive center here in statesboro georgia i'm also a um SDI instructor trainer. What we've made is a lot. <laughs> we've, I mean, where do you start? I mean, first off, we really had to revamp our entire process and how we operate. I had to let most of the staff go. So when it was really bad, we were pretty much were, it was just me. I was the only one here left. Mm -hmm. So from then, we kind of rocked on a little bit. We had one or two people who were interested in classes, nothing crazy. We didn't have our open work classes weren't full. We were doing very little combat at the time, zero leadership training at the time, because everybody was just scared. I mean, it was mm -hmm. on a bit when nobody was doing anything. There was numerous times I'd call you and find out all kinds of information to try to see what everybody else was doing, because I didn't know if it was just me or anybody else. Mm -hmm. um, we've had to basically, everyone wears a mask when they come in the shop. Uh, we've had to revamp on uh, a lot of the gear orders that we had to order, uh, stuff that we couldn't get in. I mean, we lost clients left and right because of just everything that was going on. So yeah. you really had to drop back and punt a lot of what we just had to do. I mean, yeah. And that gives you a nice platform to actually be able to change up, you know, some of your techniques to maybe, um, you know, it gives us the proof of concept ability to try something new and different and kind of forces us to try a new way of teaching or whatever. And most of your stuff is college, right? Well, I was just about to say the college was everything. That was yep. you know, 90% of what we do. The Out of the 400 certification, open water certifications we do a year, 300 of them were, were probably from the college. So there was a strong belief that we were not going to be here in the fall a, a very strong belief that we were not going to be here in the fall. Mm -hmm. luckily, I feel your pain there my friend i feel your pain <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, that was that was uh, a lot of times where i was thinking like man i'm not gonna pay rent right yep you know we, we gotta come up with something so we we came up with uh the spit and, the spit and scrub thing for um the uh, healthcare workers we started doing some of that stuff I uh, gave a bunch of bottles hey, of that up. Hey, back up. <laughs> oh, yeah. the spit and scrub as in like defog yeah. and not, yeah, yeah. Scrub. not your, yeah, yeah. I forget, not, I, I thought you were <laughs> implying you did something else. Um, 
<laughs> I, was, I was curious how that probably you're a, you're for you. took five minutes. I'm gonna have to drink after that. <laughs> took yeah. five minutes. Yeah. It went there quickly. Cheers. There's a massive history. <laughs> we're I have no doubt we are gonna get into tonight between me and Jason. So the fact that you got second place in the swims, yeah, I know. All right, uh, Eric. No, no. No. First off, it, five minutes exactly. Yeah. Five minutes for you to tell some dumbass lie. No, it's not no, true right. at all. You got second place in the float. Survival. I second second place. Place. As you do. I'm calling Brian Shreve right now. All right, go ahead. All oh, right, boy. Eric, um, what do you see as some uh, potential areas where we need to change, or what have you changed? Um, well, actually, you're you're not an instructor, right? So what what do you no. look for and what do you look for? What are you looking for in a shop that's a little bit different? So if I'm looking at, at a shop that I've never been to, I want to walk in, I want to see that A, they have product on the floor or if they're selling something, actually have it in stock so I can walk out with it. But also knowledge. A lot of times I've gone into shops in the past and I seem to have more information than the, the person on the floor. So having a competent staff is really important to me, but also make it friendly and inviting. Um, my wife and I have a, have a joke that you walk into a shop and there are white folding chairs. Um, there's more than one time I've walked into a shop and I get a look from whoever is in the shop that, why am I here? If I'm not a regular, if I'm not someone that's come in before, mm -hmm. almost as if I'm not invited into their shop. And that and and that's something that I, I've never understood in the 20 plus years of diving. I've, and I've, I've worked in the industry for a manufacturer. I've worked in a shop when I first started diving. I've never understood how you don't make people feel welcome coming into your store because you have no idea what I want to spend or what I want to do when I walk through that door. You're, we're, we are a we are a want store. We are not a need store. So I tell all my employees, the people who walk in that door want to be there. They don't need to be there. They yeah. want to be there. You have to knock them off their foot. I mean, you have to knock them off their feet as soon as they walk in the door because it's a want. You don't. It's not a need. It, it, exactly, diving isn't something I, I have to do. It's I want to do it, and I love the sport. Mm. I'm passionate about it. I've been doing it for twenty plus years. And if I'm gonna come into your store, there's a reason I'm walking into your store. Don't yeah. make me feel like I I chose the wrong shop. Yeah, and I think that inventory thing is is a struggle for a lot of shops, especially as things tend to go more internet and more. Um, you know, there's I think just I was I had to place an order today, or I was I was looking at order today, and it was uh, I think Dive Right had like thirty different wings, like yeah. between the different yeah. elbows and the you know different coatings and different colors, and it's like how how in the world would I you know, do I need a hundred thousand dollars in wings? <laughs> like to, to make sure I've got what somebody wants and needs. And then what do you, where do you make those decisions? And it's a, it's a little bit of a challenge, like you said, and then you want the shop to be a social hangout. We were talking, I was talking to Ross Baxter earlier today about this and saying, you know, I, I work with one person at the cash register. Somebody else walks in. I normally have six or seven people hanging out on my couches at the shop. And it's like the record screeches when the person walks in and I'm like, Hey, invite them over to have a conversation with you guys because like I'm busy helping this customer at least invite them over to the conversation as opposed to just staring at them because it, it can be that awkward. Like they're looking to see if it's somebody they know. And if it's not, they're like, yeah, whatever. It's just a new customer. Um, mm -hmm. You, you got to invite them over. And, and that's a tough kind of blend. Uh, Tom, your kind of opening statements there, bud, on where we need to go and, and positive change and all that. Well, I mean, I, I come from a university background. I was trained in an academic diving program and I currently teach with an academic diving program. So one of the things that we do with all of our students is we have them rent equipment from our local dive shops instead of using the university equipment. We do that for two reasons. One is so they start to develop the relationship with the dive shop because they're taking training through us but also to experience what diving not in a back plate and wing and not with a long pose is like and how to experience the quote normal gear that they'll dive if they rent. And a lot of what we see in our area is dive shops that really are looking down on them, even though they want to rent equipment because they're part of our program and they didn't take training with them. And it's, really a struggle to get that welcome atmosphere that says we actually want you to come in and we want to talk to you and we want to understand your experience 
And it sounds like you have that at your shop, Jason, and we have that at the shop down here in Greenville, but none of the dive shops in the Raleigh area have that type of atmosphere. It very much, like Eric says, seems like you're a bother when you walk in or if you're not looking to spend crazy amounts of money. There's no almost dive club atmospheres anymore in this country. And even though they may not necessarily be directly profitable to the dive shop, um, I'd like to see that type of atmosphere brought back where you have your dive shop hangout and that will eventually come back to the shop positively with positive word of mouth and instruction and people that need random pieces of gear. But also it's a good opportunity for them to find out what their customers really want. And whether that's in trips or promoting more local diving. I'm in your shop, Jason, and we have that. Ooh, someone's feeding back. Yeah. Uh, down yeah. here, we have some phenomenal local diving, but a lot of it is overshadowed by what we have off of the coast. But diving off the coast here is very expensive due to the cost of the um, boat ride. And the dive shops really aren't promoting a culture of let's just get wet every weekend. And a lot of that was driven by the university in Raleigh. And as the students have come and gone and the dive shop that was supporting that uh, closed when the owner unfortunately died, it's just very difficult to see. And I see that at the dive shop that I work with in Greenville where every weekend they're saying, let's go out to the lakes and let's go do something, even if it's just to get wet. And I think that's going to be a paradigm shift that the industry really needs to have. Yeah. And we've seen a lot more of that, you know, that, that is, we, there are some blessings with this whole COVID coronavirus thing that's going on is that we had to figure out that this um, model of continuously going you know, to other countries. And, and that's great. And that's, you know, going out and doing different things is, is excellent. But we need to balance that with local diving, because if you're balancing that, if you're just looking for a trip after a trip after a trip, then it causes all sorts of it can cause all sorts of problems. And you really want to develop some local divers and a local dive scene. And that's really going to be what we're kind of looking for. I like what Brock said, um, some of your points. Walking into a dive shop, it should be similar to Norm walking into Cheers. Uh, absolutely. Uh, 100%. Uh, that, I like that one a lot. Uh, it's tough when you get a new person. Uh, who said it? Uh, da, 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 da. Where'd it go? Um, oh, Eduardo. First impression from customers is very important. I usually greet with welcome to the candy store. That's, that's an excellent one. Uh, Joseph, you start with, uh, would you like a spit and scrub? Hi, Ed. <laughs> <laughs> well, J Jason, I mean, real quick before you move yeah. on to the but yeah. a lot of what you see, especially in the Facebook groups, are dive shop owners getting defensive and saying, oh, well, where are you going to get an air fill? And it's, well, I developed a good relationship with my volunteer fire department, and they let me hook up to their brand new 6,000 PSI 20 CFM Bauer mm -hmm. is your 30 year old piece of shit. And <laughs> they have to keep their compressors maintained. And I'm like, all I have to do is bribe them with some cookies every couple of months and they're happy. Or you see what happened in Raleigh where there's a large amount of tech divers and no shops that really want to support them. I have access to five Trimix fill stations in the triangle. So guys are establishing dive clubs in their driveway and we've got the ability to order gear online. We've got the ability to get gas fills for not a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And we have the ability to book trips and there's always independent instructors out there. And I'm just wondering if that mentality that we have that's so prevalent in cave country and some of the more remote parts of the world as well as in Europe is going to start pervading with the cost of brick and mortar going up where people just don't go into a strip mall to go to a dive shop anymore. Yeah. And that's one of the big problems, right? We have this business model that um, is retail 
almost retail centric. Uh, but with that, we've pushed a lot of people away to create their own. And we see it mostly with the with the technical kind of group, I, I believe, um, sending them off and like, I don't want to deal with you. And then suddenly wondering why all these compressors show up and suddenly they become friends. And, and these, you know, you can get like you said, and you can get fills wherever you want to type of stuff. Uh, you also run into that independent instructor that has their out of their garage type shop type of situation. Uh, but from what I've seen, that tends to like slowly lead to a mini shop and then become a shop over time. You know, I, I joke about the guy that says that you need to go live down in a van by the river to be an instructor. That's the future of the industry. Yeah. There's a guy who used to say <laughs> that. And you know what I just saw on Facebook is that he's opening a shop. I'm like, what? like the the whole ploy for multiple years is uh we're gonna do this out of a van by the down by the river and you're like all right like i'm opening a shop like uh, okay interesting pave adventures is a perfect example of that happening and now it's one of the more successful dive shops in the country and it's literally out of ed's garage that he built as necessity because there was nothing in his area but he never he doesn't have the overhead of the traditional brick and mortar store. And that's right. where similar to a lot of the breweries that get started in more industrial areas and in low cost, grandiose garages, basically. I think you're gonna start seeing that more just to keep overhead down. I think that leads to the dive club discussion that you were talking about is, um, Oh, what's the best way? I don't want to, it's, it's not to monetize it, but I think the industry needs to go that direction of let's create more dive club S that has a retail element to it. And then you have a lot of different facets being taken care of in the same situation. So, um, Mary, let's go off to you. So, so I'm the example of throwing the monkey wrench into the equation. So I love that. <laughs> and say where you're from and all that, so everybody knows. Uh, well, that is a difficult question to answer. So I'm originally from Boston. So Eric's one of my old school dive buddies. And I'm now based in Florida slash Kona. Nice. But I teach in about 10 to 12 different locations, meaning different states every single year absent COVID. <laughs> um, <laughs> so it, it's, and, and I'm a full time in the industry, but I am an unshop. Mm -hmm. I do zero retail. 100% of what I do is professional services. Mm -hmm. So training, guiding, coaching. And I run a team of instructors that are in some close to me, some in very, very disparate locations um, who have kind of a similar mindset and want to work together as a team. And thus, we have a, um, a, a network of physical brick and mortar shops who are our partners. And we try to get our divers connected up with their local resources for air fills and gear sales. And that shop needs to understand that we're the, the source of the professional services, especially we're in a very specific niche that we're in. And to some extent, COVID has been a little bit of an equalizer in the fact that regardless of whether you have a brick and mortar location or you have a team of what essentially would have been referred to as independent instructors prior. I think what I'm doing is a bit different than that model um, is now we're all talking heads on a screen mm -hmm. and we have our socialization through new media. So, um, yeah. yeah, so it's, it's a very different model that I'm part of. And part of the question is, is am I an outlier or am I the beginning of a new trend in let's pull the education away from the equipment. Yeah. And that's kind of a, I mean, dive shop, dive shops are saying the same thing. Yeah. I mean, that's, I, mean, I was just about to say, I mean, I mean, I'm basically in the same boat because we sell the gear to the students, but that's it because we have so many other competitors other than just the internet alone. Mm -hmm. that we're basically doing the exact same thing. 90% of what I did on Black Friday was training. Yeah. Right? No, like I had so I had 
12 different gear uh, setups that we, we were sales that we were doing and 90% of them about training. So it's pretty much, I mean, that's, I can say it, but that's, that's a lot of what the industry has become. Yeah. And it's, and it's hard to create that balance, right? And there's going to be some um, jockeying for position with that because you have people that uh, somebody had said it, that the Van Fleming said uh, that basically there are one person stores around that 100% of the staff is tied up as soon as the phone rings. And that's uh, essentially my shop and somewhat yours, Joseph, at this point in time, right? right? Is that, you know, it, instruction is my primary source of income. And then we do sales on top of that. I'm pretty steadfast on making sure that my pricing for, for equipment is, is reasonable and fair. And I, I follow the rules when it comes to map and all that fun stuff. But uh, it's, it is by no means our, our revenue stream and the instruction is. So it makes it very hard to run a dive shop when I should be out teaching and having a shop open is, is more of a complication than anything it else. Is, it is. Uh, it, yeah. You get your, your training is cut in half. I mean, in, or in my head. Yeah. Yeah. So, so there's plenty of times I started closing my shop down a little bit so that I could teach a little bit more. Sorry, Eric, go ahead. No, you're good. So I think what Meredith, the professional services component is really important from a shop, you know, we think of what a dive shop has become as a as a consumer we look for a place that is the place of instruction and we think whoever that instructor is at that shop is the end-all be-all person they have to have vast knowledge of all diving equipment and a travel agent and a gear technician and a fill station technician we ask for these massive amounts of things from a shop that may or may not actually be able to do all of those things mm -hmm. and i think that's also mm -hmm. a reason why why some shops struggle some shops focus on one either technical or recreational or travel only and meredith's business model is really interesting because she's like i'll take care of the training it sounds like mm -hmm. and you handle the gear sales i'm going to give you bring you in a student which is now a customer which can now be a long-term customer because i'm going to train them maybe once maybe twice maybe hopefully they keep coming back to me but you may now gain a, a customer for life because we've made that introduction and they haven't had to do anything outside of Meredith bringing them in from a training perspective. And I think that's really interesting and a good collaboration between the professional services side and what a shop can be really good at. Um, and I, I think for, for shops to survive COVID and even beyond COVID, they're going to have to find their niche where they fit in. Are they a tech, even beyond technical versus recreational? Are they a shop that focuses just on travel? Are they a niche shop? Like one of our shops here in New England, they've now transitioned to just doing appointments for dry suit fittings, backplate mm -hmm. fittings, you know, the, the more personalized one-on-one -on -one type stuff. You can still walk in to do map to, to browse, but if you want to, Jason, if I want to talk to you about buying my my first set of dive gear, I'm going to schedule some time with you so I can actually spend an hour or two with you to go over yeah. all of that. So I, I love think that you're model. Gonna, yeah. You're going to see that happen. Yeah, I love that they did that. I, I saw they were doing that. I, I think that's an excellent. We were looking at making some big sweeping changes here, and I saw that they did that and that, that wasn't necessarily on our on our radar, and I I love we were, we were kind of going a different direction, but I I love that they had they had done that thing. Uh, Let's well, see. Also, the problem with that too, though. I mean, I I one hundred percent agree with Eric. I mean, you have dop shops have to find that niche. They have to find out what they are. In my opinion, what they are. Mm -hmm. Like prime example, mine and Jason shop are two totally different. Jason yeah. is very big into the in, in the tech diving, and we have a back plate and a harness out there. That's it. That's all we do because we're a recreational shop. That's what we are. We do more recreational and public safety stuff. That, mm -hmm. That's the only thing that we'll, that's the big difference. But it's so hard for a shop owner to do that because it only takes one person to walk in, walk in here and see that we only have a backplate and harness. And they walk out of the shop, get on Facebook and blast the dive shop because yeah. we didn't carry tech stuff. Yeah. Well, that, I mean, what do you want me to do? Right. That's it, it's so incredibly hard to do because I don't, for one, we don't have the resources or the money to just load up our, our shop with everything diving related, but it's so hard. It, it is entirely so hard to, to be able to do all of that. So that brings in, that brings in the idea of when we're making this, when we're looking at this transition of being able to have instructors outside the shop and then the shop be the retail that the, the 
key year has got to be competitive, but priced correctly so they can actually make a living. So many, play, you know, we, I talked about on one of the other shows is one shop says, all right, my gear is my loss leader. And I'm just going to make pennies on that because then it'll bring people in for trips and travel or trips and, and education, or my education is my loss leader because then I can sell all these other things. And these shops are kind of, from what I've seen, will discount massively certain areas as a loss leader. Um, what I see the Costco chicken, the Costco chicken being $5 and they, they lose millions and millions, the tens of millions of dollars on chicken just to get you into Costco. Um, it works for that for Costco. Mary, you got something to say? Well, uh, but mm -hmm. I, mean, I, I do, but I, also on that point, I think when you're in a niche, like all of scuba is a niche and then there's niches within that niche. But if you're doing something that is high value, why should you have lost leaders when you're doing something that's quality? Yes, thank you. Right? <laughs> exactly. So, you know, I, I think that maybe there isn't a place for that. I mean, I also right. know I'm definitely in a niche of a niche. Right. But also it, one of the things that I do and what has kept me kind of um, resolved with the I'm not going to get involved in gear seal sales is because it actually makes it better for both my students working with a local brick and mortar and that hosting brick and mortar. Mm -hmm. that I can come in and be, and my staff can be providing impartial advice on what features, what gear to buy now, what gear to buy later. So when the student comes in to make that purchase, they know what they want, they know what to look for, they're ready to commit, and they have, uh, you know, they're more likely to be a long-term client rather than having that little voice in the back of your mind that keeps you from purchasing something going, am I just being sold mm -hmm. a, you know, a, a spiel because this thing is collecting dust on the wall and they want right. to sell it. Yeah. That well, trust Mary, element. Yeah. Mary used a very important word in that brief tirade. Um, <laughs> and the, the very important word that you used is the word client. Yeah. And, the dive industry, the way it's set up is we can all agree that it's built on the car dealership model, both from a gear manufacturer side and from a training agency side. And especially now that most all of us are under the RSTC, all the agencies are basically the same, but slightly different. And I hope against all else that there's a massive collapse in the quantity of training agencies right now because there simply isn't enough to go around but we go back to raleigh where i still teach and there's a nawi shop that sells aqualung right down the street from the patty shop that sells scuba pro right down the street from the sdi shop that sells hewish there's not enough business in the area to support all six of those brands competing against each other. And there's no need for all of the training agencies to exist anymore, especially now that the RSTC is a thing. And all they're doing is creating a larger quantity of dive shops to compete against each other, which drives the size of the shop down. And economies of scale are very important, but it also creates from that car dealership model, the used car dealership model, which is creating one-time customers, get them in, sell this shit at a hundred percent markup and then get them out the door. And who gives a shit if they continue to dive because you made your money and they're gone versus a client base model where, yeah, they're not going to spend all that money with you up front, but you're playing the long game because of what they're going to be able to bring to you over the exactly. years. And, and any shop should recognize that you're going to make less money in the first year from a mm -hmm. lifelong diver who gets addicted and this becomes an integral part of their life, but you're going to make it up in the next 10. Oh, absolutely. And, and, I, and I'm that diver. So when I, <laughs> I, years ago when I did that class, it was a 12 week class. My father and I took it. And then, you know, we bought two sets of gear within the first year. And it was like Poseidon regulators, Zegel BCDs. I still remember to this day, wetsuits. I mean, fans, we, I mean, we went, you know, we, we dove into it as a passion. It still is for me today. You know, then it became dry suits and more training and eventually trips, a trip to Florida, which eventually became cave certification for me. 
So yes, in the first year, they didn't make a ton of money, but eventually they made a lot more money. I wound up working for the shop. So they, they created not just a customer, but an employee. And, and I think that's also something that some shops don't understand that it's not just get them in, get them wet, train them and move them on. But if you keep that customer, A, they're going to be loyal to the shop or more loyal than, than they can be. And, and B, they're going to bring other people in that are want to find out about diving. So they can also become a referral source for you as well. Well, um, the, the, the churn and burn yeah. is a model. You just can't like commit to the churn and burn model and then bitch when you don't have lifelong clients. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. Right, exactly. They yeah. still do. They still do. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so we shit on the churn and burn model and I can sit on my high horse in academic diving where it doesn't matter to us. It's fine. Mare can get on her high horse with technical it's a divers. Hard task, man. It's a, that high horse is up there for me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We have, we have a step, we have a step stool, don't worry. <laughs> <I> can <laughs> you can we However, However, we also have to acknowledge and understand that the vast majority of these divers are never going to commit to this sport and accept it. And that's okay that a guy is going to take scuba training because his wife wants to go diving on their honeymoon. Like, that's okay. Yep. Yeah. But we shouldn't prioritize that at the cost of developing that client relationship with the 5% of students you have, because those are the ones that bring the other 95% in. And they instill that passion on other people. And I think that's what we're missing is we're so focused on the 95% with high turnover rates that the 5% then get lost. And that's how we get the high burnout rates and the pissed off divers that go set up fill stations in their garage. Right. And that you have to identify have, them as I can't get too mad about it. Right. right. Yeah. You got to identify them as, as we've talked about this the other night is, you know, um, before we get too far off track with it is that those are two separate customer spaces completely. They're, they're both starting as open water divers, but they have two very drastically different needs. And if we're meeting their needs, one person just wants to do it on vacation and one person wants to be a lifelong diver. But there are some people that want to be lifelong divers that don't quite know it yet and showing them what's around and what's exposing them to what's available is uh, is pretty much key. I'm gonna go to a comment by Brock really quick before we bring Kevin in, because I think Kevin's gonna have a, a different opinion or a different uh, perspective than everybody else does. Uh, in my opinion, dive clubs are a thing of the past, create a community around the local dive shop, not a click. Well, what if the dive club was the local dive shop? Well, and I was, I was about to say, I, I, I kind of respectfully disagree with, with Brock a little bit on that, only because we we based our social gatherings when we could. We did ours off of basically, if I hate to say it, but off of yours was because of numerous times. I'm, wait, wait, what you say? What you say? I'm not giving you a big head at all. <laughs> but what I'm saying is that you had a great idea. We, it was just a gathering. It was just to get a couple of people in the shop talk about diving, getting diving. They don't have to buy anything. I don't want them to buy anything. I want them to be here. I want them to meet new people. I want them to get to know uh, the other divers that are locally in our area and go dive. That was the whole point. If we if we ate all of the food and drank all of the beer, then that was a win. For a dive shop, that's a win. What kind of beer you You're have? getting everybody together. <laughs> well, I want to know what kind of beer you had. Now we're asking. It's none of your damn business. That's what you you had no light, didn't you? You had no, shit. Like, you had no, no light. light. You had complete garbage. No, God no, damn. No, you had piss money. water out no, of here. God there will never, never be Miller Light in this shop. You had sweet water? No, he had nat he had natty light and natty light. Come on. Hey, when I mean, you come up, you gotta bring hey. me some sweet sweet water. Do not hate on natural light, bro. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> Jesus. All right. So Kevin, yeah, go ahead. Do you use the kegerator as a cheap loss leader? And if you have a traditional brick and mortar, does that not say, well, now there's 15, 20 people in the dive shop. So all the people going to the grocery store right next to you are going, oh, shit, what's going on in there and pop in. Yeah. And do you also use that mentality of 
all your students, you say, hey, every Wednesday night at seven o'clock, everyone comes in and we kind of talk about the diving we did last week and we order a bunch of pizzas in and the kegerator's open. If you want to pitch in five bucks for beer and pizza, happy days. But that's how you get your 5% is the students that actually show up and talk about local diving and prioritize that. And I think that's how you get the clients. But yeah, we're trying to organize ours a little bit more because right now it's hit or miss. Like, I don't know. That's why I had to move the show to 730 because I don't know when I got to kick people out at seven and they're going to leave at 720. You know, it used to be yeah. seven, 715 show that, you know, I just couldn't make work because trying to get um, people going. Um, so, Kevin. Yes. You have been quiet in my <laughs> bottom left hand corner from as I see you. I think, yeah, bottom left hand corner as I see you. Uh, what is your background? And I don't know what insights you might have currently. So go right ahead. Well, I'm in the in the Cincinnati area. So we have about five dive shops in the area. Two are in northern Kentucky, three are over in, in Ohio. So I don't know much about the ones over in Ohio, but I do know the two over in in my area, one's about a mile from my house, they work with each other. So there's an industry and there's a community. So um, that is one ridiculous. Does, yeah. one <laughs> that does, does not happen. That, that, that one, is one does, one does um, repair. The one that's closest to me does repair on gear. And it's not uncommon for the other shop to say, hey, we need this repaired. So one's an SSI and one's a patty. So sometimes they refer to each other. If they have that model is going to work better for someone going the other way. They have instructors that take courses from both places or, or advanced open water people who take from both places. So um, it's more the community model works better than the industry one. Now, I can also tell you, I did private instruction. So um, and they didn't set this up as a concept fan, but what um what I did was private instruction. It was 400 plus dollars. My instructor wound up making maybe $50 out of that. Mm -hmm. So the instructors that are doing this are the ones that the ones that are good are the ones that love it. And the ones that want to bring it to someone else and want to be an ambassador for the sport. Those are, are the people that you need, not the churn and burn as you, as you're putting it. Mm -hmm. um, I've seen the churn and burn where I've gone in a shop and they've run the whole, you want fries with that with me, like, oh, you can work your way all the way up to master scuba diver. And it's daunting to see the path that you have to take to do this. And it almost feels like you have to decide then just just get them interested and get them going. Um, mm -hmm. The shop that I went through, it's not uncommon for people to come back in. They're going to take a trip. They haven't gone diving for a couple of years and they just do a refresher with the with the um, with the shop. So they build that community. Someone comes in the door, that's, they're not ignored. It's more, hey, how you been? If they know who it is. And if it isn't, hey, what can we do for you? And we'll show you around. And, and it's inviting the way it should be that Eric describes. Well, one other comment, Tom needs to um, up his ante because if you look in the comments, cookies are not cutting it. Um, oh, yeah, I saw um, that. Yeah, You're going to have he was, to start getting sobs or something like that. Yeah, that wasn't going to happen from what I saw. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Kevin, what's your background? So um, I've I've wanted to be a diver since I was a kid. I didn't start doing this until last year. I have six kids. I've been married 34 years. I'm 56 years old. So we got all that stuff out of the way first because <laughs> wow. I couldn't I couldn't afford to do it. It's expensive. And then I'm landlocked. So you're looking at a trip anytime yeah. or going to a quarry that's three hours north of me. And I mean, you can only do Corey so much, right? You want, you want to do this because it's on a trip. So um, it, it took a little while to get into it, but I do love it. And I'm just taking it as it comes. I'm not, I don't have a path of, I'm not going to do this or I'm going to do that. I'm just, I'm having fun doing it. And that's what I think is missed sometimes is people having fun in the sport. That's what they need to push. But like I said, there's an industry and then there's a community and what, some of the people that I know on here, I've met through that community because of the pandemic. So I would trust their judgment and and their advice more than I would just walking in some place that I know nothing about. Yeah, and I think that's, I think the community part is what a big part of what we're missing on on a lot of different levels um, with all of this. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> somebody said. Uh, dive shop open house and then another person said um 
slideshow from a recent trip or guest speakers. When, when we work together as more of a, a, a even a global community, we can we can go off of resources and get more people diving, and we all benefit from more people diving. Uh, every single one of us does. We if there are more people diving, um, as long as they're they're the the group we want and as serious as we want and the clientele that we're looking for. And as we increase that grouping, then that whatever percentage of serious divers we can get out of that, that's that it just increases that whole number. And as you, the community becomes fun, it, you look at any sports running in the 1980s was massive. And then now it's biking. And when somebody tells me that, that like you said, Kevin, it's, this is expensive. We have, we have a very, very, a uh, good bike shop local to us and a couple of our instructors bike and the bikes people buy are six, seven, eight, nine, ten grand. And yeah, yeah we get liberties like, oh, we can't sell rebreathers that are hardly anybody like $2,000 is too much for uh, a set of life sustaining equipment. And somebody's like, oh, I spent three grand on my bike. You're like, but yeah. uh, this yeah. keeps you alive underwater. Like, yeah, I just someone you mentioned that in the comments. Yeah. That was really important was that it? they mentioned. And that's the way I was taught. This is life support equipment. This is not like just fun stuff you have to have. This sustains your life. And and someone said that in the comment before, um, earlier. And it's it's an important point. And the way they teach you and and the respect for what you're doing and the environment you're in, um, is really important. I I was taught to do my skills at Hover. Because it's ridiculous to tell somebody they have to stay off the bottom, okay? But we're going to put you on your knees to do all these these mm -hmm. um, exercise, you know, all these skills. And it isn't a requirement of the shop. It's just the way the instructor taught. If I don't like that instructor, I don't like learning that way. There are other options, and they're more than willing to say, "Hey, we're not a good fit for each other. Let me find this other person for you." That's and big. that's the type of community that you need. Is Jason, more than I, industry. I so, and I could hold on, Joseph. <laughs> One sec, Joseph. Mayor, go ahead. So, so Kevin, I really like that you're you're seeing the value in the community, but you mentioned mm -hmm. something in there that I I think we can't just gloss over is that mm -hmm. your private instructor made mm -hmm. fifty dollars. Yeah, and it's great to have hobbyists that do this. Right. But how would the trade develop if we're reliant upon? hobbyists willing to work for peanuts mm -hmm. and can you have a true professional if all there is out there is peanuts exactly yeah so yeah i mean that's i think a a big question and it's kind of the elephant in the room when it comes to a shop that either hires independent instructors or has in-house instructors if you look at other activities um you know, my wife rides horses. She doesn't, she takes a lesson once a week. I think it's 75 or a hundred dollars for that half hour, 45 minute lesson. Um, other disciplines, people are willing to pay money for that instruction because mm -hmm. they value the time of that instructor because that person has put the time in and, and there's a value there. They're not just the hobbyist, but there, there's a lifelong level of experience. And that's something I've, I've never understood in the industry. We look to people to train us, but mm -hmm. yet at some level we're like, yeah, you'll make five bucks a student or whatever it is. It's always, a, it, it's like the lost leader. And I, if I'm going to go have a, a class or even a, a session where I'm doing some type of training outside of a class, I'm willing to pay for that because A, it's the instructor's time, but B, there's value in that time. I'm becoming a better diver or I'm learning something from that time. I'm working with that person. So Eric, that's where the industry has shot itself in the foot because you look at high-end biking, you look at equestrian, they've created value within He's their, fancy. whereas the scuba industry has mm -hmm. taken, in my opinion, the wrong approach, which is everyone can go scuba diving. And what that's done is drive prices down and drive the value of our time as instructors down because they're trying to appeal to the masses via Walmart instead of going and saying, all right, we do something that is exclusive. We do something that is very valuable mm -hmm. and we're going to prioritize creating the value around ourselves instead of literally driving everything to the bottom. You see dive shops competing with each other and instruction gets cheaper and cheaper every year. You look at the equipment and their margins get lower and lower every year. 
and there's nothing you can do about it. And yet you see all of these agencies and all of the manufacturers spending tens of thousands of dollars at DEMA every year for a giant circle jerk that is only serving to ruin the ability of all of the instructors and dive shop owners to make money as they're continuing to try the mass appeal approach, which is not working. So the question is, should we be dividing scuba into, at the most basic level, two different certifications where you have the mass appeal that does not allow you to go out and dive independently, that you have to have a dive master that's there making sure you don't, you know, put your reg on backwards and BC on upside down and keeps you from killing yourself underwater. And then we have another level of training for people who are, it's gonna cost more, but you're gonna get more. I think so part I of the problem there though, is the complications surrounding that differentiation and the industry can't figure itself out now with just the mass appeal aspect and yet you teach for an exclusive agency, I teach in an exclusive manner, and we're okay with that. But then do we really go and try to mass appeal? Or do we just say it's not worth it and we're going to focus on creating value around ourselves? And you've done that very well, but most of the industry is afraid to say no they're afraid to turn customers away even though they're going to be more trouble than they're worth and yet you see that in the high-end industries with equestrian and high-end biking all the time where i'm sure eric your wife's trainer has turned students away because they're not worth their time and we won't do that as an industry because the industry model has said no is everyone 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 bring them in even if you're only making 50 bucks for a class that you spent 20 hours teaching it's like yeah, and, I'm making uh, two uh, an hour i i mean as the consumer walking into a shop as someone who wants to get certified i see the name or the title of instructor and i assume that person has this wealth of knowledge i know nothing about that person other than they're an instructor mm -hmm. so you know that's the first piece like there, there's, you know, looking back, I I was very lucky. The instructor I had that got me certified, had a had a, a wealth of knowledge and was very good and competent at what they did. But, you know, I hear when I worked on a boat, I saw horror stories in person of people who had just been certified, and it scared the living shit out of me mm -hmm. that people actually had their C cards at that point. Um, I I think there's a the, the value component is mo is really important. Should we appeal ourselves to every person? Honestly. No, it's okay to go, I mean, look at skydiving outside of a question and biking, but other activities where you need to work with a trainer, even golf, where you can t take instruction from someone or tennis, where you're doing these activities and the person is saying, here's the value I bring. I, I've never understood why as an industry or as, as, as a hobby or as a passion, we go to these people and be like, train me, but I want to pay you five bucks. Mm -hmm. Like I... Like, I mean, here's, I, here's the thing as a professional, you have to kind of pick which model you're on. Unless you're yeah. in a super big company, it mm -hmm. is very difficult for one person or a business that's two, three, four, five people to have the budget model and the niche premium. Mm -hmm. Because once you kind of figure out your best way of doing things, and that best way could be, I'm going to put a lot of energy into low ratios and really good neutrally buoyant divers or your best way could be i'm going to expose a very large amount of people to the beautiful underwater world through what we're calling a little bit derogatory churn and burn mm -hmm. but sure once is. you decide what is your best way it's really hard to do the other one and not have your best way bleed over and that goes both directions hey and there i asked jason to leave this comment from joseph up below and yeah. That serves to prove my point, because if you look at equestrian, they're not looking for the cheapest and quickest. They only look for that because that's what is in all of the marketing materials from the industry across the board. And some exceptions, especially with 
that one over there. But um, <laughs> it's the exception that proves the rule. But if that model of cheaper and quicker is what we've created, then that's the model that we have to break. And I think the equestrian is a much more relevant analogy than looking at golf or tennis because there's KPIs in golf and tennis that you can measure and we can't do that in diving, whereas equestrian is largely a pleasure sport, but they're not seeking out the cheapest and quickest instruction. They're seeking out premium instruction because that's the model that industry has created for themselves. Yep. Um, Let me go to Joseph Joseph really quick, but first. um, That's just hard to do. It's so hard to do. And and Jason knows the way that I teach him. And and I I understand exactly what you're saying. But as a dive shop, that is so hard to do. Separate the two, you're saying? We have to separate the two. And it is, is, I can't even describe how hard that that is. And we understand that. I mean, I I just fully understand exactly what you're talking about. And I understand that it takes a lot to do, but it, it's the mentality it's of the people happen. now. In my opinion, it, it, is, it, it is it's the mentality of the people of who are actually coming in. They want they want to be certified. They want to know how much it costs. But they want to know when when will they be done. That's that. And so Joseph's comment was exactly correct because I see, I mean I see that shit every day. They come in. They want to know how much does it cost. What how long is it going to take? And what can I do when I get done? That's all they want. That's all they care about. And if I don't give them that, and I don't give them the best instruction that I can in that short amount of time, they'll go somewhere else. And it's just a matter of fact. That's exactly what they're going to do. And as a dive shop owner, that is so hard to control because I bring them in by word of mouth. They know that we can teach. And they know that we we understand how to teach. And they know that we're going to teach them the right way and not some someone else. But if I don't get them in, and then they walk out of my store. I cannot guarantee that they're coming back because so of that. I, and that, I, I will say that's sorry, fighting the industry left and right. Oh, the industry is yeah. combating that by pushing the Walmart model. I agree. The industry accepts that we need to have a paradigm shift. I don't think the dive shops are going to be able to do it unless you are the only shop in an area. Mm-hmm. And you don't have competition that is shooting you in the foot as well as themselves. Oh, absolutely. There's no way for you to change that paradigm unless the industry helps and starts from the bottom. I mean, as, well, the, how, as the one how that, are they going to do it, that? So, so as a as someone walk into a shop, Joseph, I, I would ask. So, your your time is has a lot of value to it. Don't ever short sell that. And as a student. As say an open water student, if I was told, hey, this class is 12 weeks, and my, my open water class was 12 weeks, six lessons and six pool sessions of two hours or two plus hours. So it was a lot of in water time versus what happens today. Um, and this was in the mid 90s. So it's, it's been a while. But the value, and I remember sitting with the owner was, you're going to become a comfortable person in the water that feels comfortable when they're diving, not just get a C card. The C card actually never came up. And it was when you finish my class, you're going to be comfortable in the water, comfortable diving on your own, diving with our shop dive club, because we want you to enjoy the sport and grow with the sport. So they sold it as this is the gateway to learn more. This isn't the one, this isn't where you're going to stop. We want to get you into the point where this is your starting block, not your ending point. And, and that may have been lost in some shops and some shots say, Hey, we'll get you in three days. We'll get you out with a certification Mm -hmm. card. But are those the people that are going to enjoy diving? I mean, there's a, I think James Mott had a comment, wealth of knowledge equals 100 dives. I mean, that I think opens a, a, a bigger conversation within the industry is, do we really want people training other divers at 100 dives? And does the industry, which I think is itself is its own worst enemy, having worked in it and been outside it as a customer, at 100 dives, are you really prepared to train someone to become a, a, a diver? At 100 dives, have you experienced enough as a diver to feel comfortable training other people to dive? That's a whole separate conversation. Yeah, that's a whole and separate, 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 separate And that's just one component. Where were these 100 dives? Were they all in a quarry? Because yeah. I mean, that, exactly. that's a big, big change also. One dive 100 times. If, yeah. yeah. <laughs> if we need the Walmart model to get people in the door, mm-hmm. but we're trying to find the 95%, 
well, what if somebody's looking for one of those 5% that wants a really good tri bike, but the only bikes they've ever seen exist are the shitty bikes that are in every Walmart that's in, you know, five different locations in your town and they don't know where the boutique is. So to some extent, it's realizing that I think if, if, I think people have to realize that, especially in this day and age, and this is in all industries, if you try to be a jack of all trades and you don't have the resources of an Amazon, you're going to do them all poorly. So know your niche and know how to serve your clients by plugging them into someone else. Do you think right. I don't have people who call me up and they're not a good match for what I do? And I send them to somebody who is. Exactly. And those people sometimes send me someone later saying, you know what, this wasn't for me, but I think this person is right for you down the road. And, no and that's, market, that's no how it works in my area, because um, I, there's the book and there's everything that the industry tells them they have to do in order to certify somebody. But I had an instructor who said, we're not moving on until I say you're ready to move on to the next thing. It wasn't, we're going to do this in three hours. It's going to take six weeks. It's going to take it. That's up to you, whether you're ready to move on to the next part or not. And you're not moving on until I say you're ready to move on until you've proven to me that you are. And that's the way that they operate. The other thing that they do that I, that I like is I'm not going to teach you all the way through. There, you need a variety of instructors. You need other people besides. So that, it, that referral that you're talking about happens because it's a community and not just following cookie cutter what the industry says to do. Good. Uh, before we get to James Mott's comment, because uh, Joseph asked for that to be put up there. I believe that's the one. Um, and Tom wanted to see it too. Uh, Eric, I wanted to bring up something really quick that you, you made a mention to and call some light onto that is when you sat, you said when you sat down with the shop owner, did you literally sit down with the shop owner? I did. We sat in their classroom on two metal folding chairs. And he asked <laughs> me why what and, and why we wanted to go, why I wanted to learn how to scoop that. So you he interviewed you and you interviewed him essentially. Love it. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So that is how I we handle every single student that wants to take a class is that you, especially technical or instructional or anything, we need to have an interview to make sure that we match as a and they're interviewing me as much as I'm interviewing mm -hmm. them is saying, you need to make sure that my educational style is going to match what your expectations are, or we're not going to have a fun time because I've had some really, really, really bad experiences of people that we didn't match up and I should have interviewed them. And I learned that a long time ago. Uh, Kevin, I'm assuming based on your head shakes, you had the same experience yes. when you were doing yours. So yes, exactly. Good. Because I wanted the instructor wanted to make sure that it was going to be a good match between the two of us, and that the that it was going to be beneficial for both of us. And and to the fifty dollar comment, I want to say something else to that. In in the community that I'm in, I have a friend that referred me into the shop, and that friend also is um an, a dive master. So I said, hey, he doesn't make a lot of money off of this. So if you really appreciate the extra time that he's doing in this and he's doing something, do a little something extra for him. Um, when I had my certification dives, we went up to the quarry and he had two dive masters in training that helped with my certification. And it was a private certification otherwise. And I was, I was clued in, hey, you tip dive masters. This is how this works, right? Because <clears throat> eventually you'll be in that situation. So it became my biggest fear and problem was who am I going to be paired with if I go on a trip and I don't know this person and did they just get a card and do it in a weekend? And, and, you know, that was my big apprehension in diving with somebody. I would rather go with someone that I, I know but that's not always possible. So that's the part that, that I get really, what, how did the other shop train them? Mm -hmm. Interesting. So, um, <clears throat> Uh, we are at one hour and I drank one hour of whiskey, but we're going to continue on. I'm going to get some more whiskey here in a minute. Uh, Joseph, while I'm doing that, let me read this comment really quick so that everybody can hear it. Uh, additionally, so many dive shops are run by uh, by dinosaurs that gave up educating themselves after 1993 and think that is all they ever need to know. There's multiple requests for this one. Joseph requested first. Joseph, you got the floor. I just want to tell. I just want to ask. What uh? What makes a shot a dinosaur shot? Your face. No. <laughs> so, Joseph, they, this has come up on the 
Monday night Zoom calls with the Great Dive podcast quite often, and it, it circles back to the root of what we've been talking about for the last hour, which is the industry model that so many of these dive shops are using is rooted from 30 years ago before the internet existed and really existed. And they think that they can still teach and sell like they used to 30 years ago, even though the entire world has changed around them and they fuse, refuse to adapt. And hey, Jason, does this remind you of our ITW? Pardon? Jason, does this remind you of our ITW? Yes, it does. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Jamesy, I'm going to fix your comment for you and say that the entire industry is run by fucking dinosaurs that have refused it's to a adapt. family show. Ninety-three. No, it's not. <laughs> uh, it's after there's whiskey three. involved. Kids are in bed. Yeah. So, if the entire industry is run by these dinosaurs that are in this giant circle jerk that is Dima, and all they do is sit there and talk about the glory days of the 90s and how they want to go back to that. Well, we don't want to go back to the 90s. We want to move forward to the 2020s. And that means we have to step back and look at how people want to learn, how they want to make purchases, how they want to interact with each other and move towards that direction. We don't need this car dealership model with 14 different training agencies that are doing the same damn thing. And the best thing I think right now would be for the training agencies to collapse and focus together to drive the industry forward instead of fighting with each other in the damn sandbox all day, trying to one up each other by getting $20 cheaper and oh, well, my training materials are now free. Well, where's your damn source of revenue now? So- But are we doing ourselves a disservice by calling the entire industry dinosaurs when there are out those of us out there trying to do something different because the old system is broken? Because you have to adapt. You have to. If you're not, so the dinosaur I'm, shops will die. So- when I'm talking about the industry, I'm talking about the agencies and I'm talking about the manufacturers. And I, it's convenient that I'm wearing a shirt of a manufacturer that is bucking the trend in the industry and is not the first one to do it. But, and Meredith trains for an agency that was founded to buck the industry. And the rest of the industry has failed to adapt and they're, it's not that they've failed to adapt. It's that they're fighting the adaptation. They don't want to, and they're refusing to. Now, individual instructors, individual dive shops, yeah, you guys are doing everything you can to fight an entire dinosaur that's marching in the wrong direction towards the lava pit while you're, you have a rope on his tooth trying to pull him back. And until that dinosaur turns around, we're heading into a very scary place. But I think a lot of those those major industry players are playing towards the traditional retail model, which we are already saying that should be separated out and in, into a separate area. So I don't think they're terrible with some of the stuff they do with some of the companies just copying each other's regulators and charging way more for, for them. I mean, that presents a whole completely different thing when there's three identical regulators that cost different amounts where the service kits are $15 from one company and $50 from another company. And it's blatantly the exact same copy of a copy of a copy and made in the same factory with some of them. So, so most so of I them. Would, yeah. I would, I mean, well, I would argue that it, for shops to survive or for shops to become a place of learning, then gear sales and community learning community and then gear sales, if you want to list it is you really have to look at that, that paradigm of, of the gear manufacturer, right? They're asking brick and mortar stores to have, you know, opening orders of thousands of dollars worth of equipment. Is that even viable these days? I mean, I don't really think so. I mean, for small shops, not necessarily, I don't see that happening on a realistically, um, or being, or saying you have to bring in $10,000 worth of dry suits before I'll even be, let you become a dealer. That's not 
But the reason they're doing that is because you said, Eric, you want to be able to walk in and walk out. And if they can keep and make sure that you have a certain amount of material in there to make sure that they keep you, Eric, as a customer, they're saying, and you can argue it to what it is, but when you look at it, they go, I want to make sure that you have everything we possibly could need, right or wrong. Their idea is we want to make sure you've got a full line and represent us well so that when Eric walks in, he sees whatever line and wants to walk out with it. We also need, you know, people in the industry that support some sort of a brick and, and mortar type of shop. The ones that say, screw the brick and mortar, we want them all to close like, or have a in between kind of model of, yeah, we want certain ones to make sure that they're really close, but other ones we want to work with. Yes, be selective, but when it becomes a uh, popularity contest with certain smaller vendors, that becomes a little bit of a different thing. Mary, you're going to say yeah, something. Yeah, I've got two objections on the okay. one thing that's dangerous about the you got to stock all of the things is no store with the niche type of field that we're in, especially if you want it to be conveniently located, can have the wide range of all of the things that will fit Eric's specific needs. Right. So if you come in and the right widget for you is this other thing, and maybe you already know you want that other thing, but they have 12 of the other widget that isn't the best thing for you on the wall. They're going to try to sell right. you that widget hard right. rather than what is the best thing for your needs. And I just want to push one more thing on Tom. Of I want to take back the industry. By saying the industry is a dinosaur is abdicating that other people get to decide what our industry is. So while my arms may be short and T-Rex-like, I am not a dinosaur. <laughs> I am taking that back that we are the ones that are going to define this industry. And let's just call them old school and let them do their thing. And, you know... The, the people who have done some really cool things are not in the majority. Uh -huh. And you're doing that and you have that opportunity in this pandemic because through the great dive podcast, the other podcasts that are out there, this Monday call, what we're doing right now has kept me interested in diving and has kept me in, in this, right? Whereas the average person would have just went and given it up or, I'll do this, you know, when I have time or when I take a trip or, or whatever. It just depends on, on what you want to do with it. But keeping it this way and, and you're kind of revamping it from the inside by talking about it and showing people your expertise and getting them interested through the Internet and through these type of vehicles, that's going to make the change. And just to tease one of your future topics, Jason, if 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 I if I. Uh, bought into that this was somebody else's industry, I wouldn't have done half of the things I've done as a woman in this industry. Yeah, very nice. In two weeks, we're talking about females in the industry and we got a couple of surprises in there for that. So that's going to be fun for everybody. So that that's where we're getting at with that. But that's, yeah, we're trying to retain people in this industry, right? And, and you know, a traditional retail model can work. Here is what you buy. As long as we are saying, this is what works. And I know, you know, certain people have all sorts of issues with different regulators and say, this one works and this one doesn't work. For the most part, they all pretty much work and work pretty damn well for the most part. Um, you know, with the quality the controls down, that we have. It boils down to an opinion. So someone yeah. who comes into my shop and says, well, I don't know anything about these. Oh, well, they all work and they all breathe great. But, you know, here's my opinion. That's what they want. They want my opinion. And yep. They want the opinion of, of a professional. That's mm -hmm. the opinion that they want when they come in. And, and, that's and just, that should be worth money because absolutely. that should be worth something. And a lot of people forget that and just go, well, I'm mad at so-and-so because they bought whatever on online. Well, yeah, mm -hmm. they got, no, they, in theory, they got very little feedback or, uh, uh, information from those people. I mean, there might be some reviews online and they might have some chat bot person that's behind it that harasses you every single time you get on their website to check the other people's pricing. But um, like, <laughs> yeah, I met it on that a couple of times. Hey, you're okay. back. I'm like, yeah, every, shut up. <laughs> every dive shop owner has done that. Any dive shop owner who says they haven't done that is completely full of shit. Yep. <laughs> Jason, is that not where 
as part of moving forward, I mean, Joseph did it with his shop of how to reduce overhead. Mm -hmm. And the easy and fast way is lack of personnel. And Mayor has said, how do I reduce my overhead? And that's living in a van by the river. <laughs> and, it's, a, it's a very nice van. But I'll also, say this, I'll also say it's a nice river too, right? Finish. Yeah. But I'll also say this time before you finish, reducing the number of people in my dog shop was not necessarily a good thing. That was something that mm -hmm. I had to do at the time. Mm -hmm. Correct. Correct. So for the long game of how do we reduce overhead, is that something where circling back to these dinosaur shop owners that are refusing to adapt, do you need the big fancy brick and mortar in the strip mall? Or do you look at moving to a lower cost venue where you can set up outdoor training spaces and a place to go hang out by a fire pit behind the dive shop because you're in an industrial area with large quantities of parking and outdoor space. You go and buy a big enough space, make a shit ton of an investment in an indoor pool mm -hmm. and hire training staff to teach swimming lessons. So now yeah. you have a dive well that you can train in every year. You diversify your income by training little kids how to swim yeah. and pay crazy amounts of money for kids to learn how to swim and birthday parties movie nights yeah they have birthday uh, parties boy scouts oh, they do that. stuff for the boy scouts and, that, and, that, yeah. and, that's, and that's so great that you bring that up because if if you're a dive shop owner right now and you're not thinking about that then you're a dinosaur <laughs> Yeah. I, I mean, yeah. I mean but I, also the flip side to that, the problem is we just said that uh, dive shop owners own wear seven different hats. And now we've added mm -hmm. on to organizing and plan maybe they're teaching the, the swim subs, but organizing and planning and, and overseeing a pool situation, indoor pool and HVAC systems and uh, all that stuff for a heated pool that, to take care of that sort of thing. We are in a different climate, Joseph. Don't give me your head shaking crap. It is 20 some odd degrees and snowing here. I don't want to hear it from you. Right now. Shut up. <laughs> but Jason, part of diversifying your streams of income and expanding your business means that now you can hire an aquatics director to take care of the pool and deal with teaching swim lessons and you now have more streams of income coming in. So it's not one guy trying to deal with all of this. It's learning how to run and expand the business that is related to diving, but mm -hmm. not necessarily in diving. I mean, yeah. I would even argue when I worked in a shop, we had people come in that didn't know how to swim. And I had to explain to them, here's the YMCA down the street. I want you to be, I'd love for you to come back when you know how to swim so we can train you. But they didn't know how to swim. They wanted to learn how to dive because they were afraid of the water. From a revenue stream perspective, think about it. We just said, hey, instead of going for dive classes, here's 12 swim lessons. Let's get you comfortable learning how to swim first. And then I have now a student that I can bring up through learning how to swim into snorkeling, into open water diving. Yep. And I've, I've moved them along in their education I'm not saying here's your card. The card never comes into it. It's their goal of wanting to become a diver. So now I've educated them on how to swim. Maybe they bring in other people, but at the end of the day, I'm I'm giving this person new skills to as they move along in their life. Um, I, I also have never understood, and some dive shops do this and some don't, is if I buy something online, because maybe I don't have access to a dive shop or I didn't think to go to my shop, and I go to my shop to get it serviced, they turn me away because I didn't buy it from them. Or wow. I have a question on something. I This hasn't happened here in the shops I use. It happened years ago when I lived in New York um, to people that I know in our shop. And but Or I bought a piece of equipment online and I have no idea how to use it because I'm an idiot and I bought it online and I should have probably had my dry suit measured, right? But instead of a customer coming into a shop and saying, I need help now, that shop turns that person away versus, hey, yeah, you didn't buy it from me. But here, we're going to set up a session. It's a hundred bucks for a couple hours of my time. Yep. I'm going to go through it now with you. And now you're That's... instilling in that person that value of why I can help you as a professional or someone that understands that product mm -hmm. on what you should have or maybe should not have bought. That's the the shop close to me does that. So yeah. it, you can bring it into them and they're not going to turn you away because you didn't buy it from them. 
they may ask you where you got it from. They may ask you how you got it. But the other thing is you'll have somebody come in and they're interested in something and they don't have it. And maybe they don't know about it. It's a different dive computer or something they haven't seen. If they know there's someone that's in their shop or in their community, say you were in there, Eric, and they knew that you used the particular computer, they would ask, hey, Eric, well, how is this? You know, they would they would bring you into this and they build that that community that I'm talking about. They have very minimal equipment in, in the store, the basic stuff to get somebody through an open water class. Anything else, they would prefer you don't buy it over the internet. They want you to support the shop, but they'll order it for you and have it sent there. Don't have it sent to your house and have somebody steal it off your porch. We'll, we'll help you out with it and we'll order it and we'll help fit you for it if it's a BCD or whatever it is. So they provide that, um, that service. <laughs> It's a sheer water. <laughs> it's a sheer water. So the answer is always a sheer water, right? Yeah. Um, well, my boss, my boss, my my um, dive instructor had a, a, a Tarek. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he was actually. So no, kind of. Um, but he had a Tarek and they're like, how do you like that computer? Because someone else was interested in it. And I'd like to be able to tell them next time they're in or next time I talk to them, what you think of that particular computer. So, and they offer that opinion. So, yeah. Yeah, and there's a lot of opinions. I mean, I've got, I'm biting my tongue a lot at a lot of things that are popping up that I want to just slam down. And and I know that um, it, it is primarily my opinion. And that's, I think, a challenge with a lot of people of, um, especially when we start talking about gear selection and what you should be purchasing and what people, they have to realize that it's their opinion. And part mm-hmm. of that comes from when somebody comes in with something online that they, you know they got cheap as crap. And they come in, they want to get set up. And the initial comment is, my opinion is that is bullshit. That is right. garbage equipment, but I'm going to help you set it up. It's hard to be able to set that up and uh, and charge a, a general fee uh, to do so and be uh, confident or... Uh, proud in your work sometimes yeah. and say, you know, this is the hose routing is shit that's coming off of this regulator for what you wanted to do. And being able to say that nicely is sometimes a challenge. Well, and the other yeah. thing is that shop that I went to has a pool. So the gear that they have hanging around that pool and they have you select when you take your, your pool sessions, they want you to choose different things on the wall. They want mm-hmm. you to go try this one or see what you think of that. And one's an atomic and one's a, you know, a Mari's and, and they're all different gear. And you, and you can say, Hey, what's this one like? And you, you start to feel what works for you. And then they fit you through that rather than just, Hey, we're going to sell you this package and then you're done. Uh-huh. Jason is accepting the gear that was purchased dirt cheap online and walking them through. So sure. Charge, charge them what it costs to set it up, but walk them through what you're doing and say, this is how we bring value to you as a local dive shop. So yes, you may be paying more, but you've now seen the experience of buying cheap online and what we've had to do to help you get set up properly. And if you have a good community model, then that story will transition from the original customer who tried to save a hundred bucks. And then it'll go to everyone else that says, look, these guys are actually going to try to take care of you and they will steer you in the right direction. And that gives you the opportunity to demonstrate the value that you have as a local dive shop instead of just buying online. Like for me, the shirt that I'm wearing, I just bought five regulator sets from them. And they said to the guy in shipping who also does assembly and testing of all the regulators, they're like, just throw them in a box. And the guy in the warehouse was balking. He was like, well, I can't do that. Every reg has to get assembled and tested and matched to each other. And they're like, it, no, it's going to talk. He's going to do it anyway when they get to his house. So just ship them. And that's the model that some of these manufacturers are starting to take. But the majority of them are not. The majority of them are coming straight from their factories. They sit in the warehouse for Aqualung or Scuba Pro, and then they head out. And the boxes haven't been opened since they were packed in the factory. 
And that's where you guys have to demonstrate value as dive shop owners. Now, does that say on your website, on your Facebook page, wherever, that this is what we're doing when you buy a regulator set from us, and this is a $60 value, and we validate that the IP is correct on the first stage. We match the cracking pressures on your second stage to the specific first stage. We help make sure that your hose lengths are right and that the routing is the way you want it. And we do all of this, and this is how we bring value to you. Put it on your website and say it's an $80 value that you charge and have it as a service fee. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, that's that brings up, you know, Kyle's basically going to look at Dive Gear Express and buy everything online. And and who's going to, is he going to check all his IP pressures? Is he going to check all of his stuff? And and buying online is buying online. Re regardless, it's going to be there. It's going to happen. But, you know, if if he's not near a local dive shop, then okay. But if he is near a local dive shop, then why isn't he shopping there or working with that dive shop? And I think that comes back to the question of, if he's close, is there an issue? Why doesn't he trust his local dive shop? Or is it just based off of price? And basically everything's map protected, right? So everything should be the same price one way or the other. If it comes to the dive shop, but not them directly. Yeah. Then sometimes the dive shop's cheaper. We have a crazy cheap pack, a crazy inexpensive package that we put together. We spend a lot of time. We make sure that they're in the right stuff. Um, and then, all right. So Kyle did respond. Um, just re researching, not looking to buy regs. Okay, so he's just looking at it. So, but it brings up, you know, the general idea of Kyle. Kyle brought up a point that a lot of people do is they're shopping, shopping for that sort of stuff, and, and then bringing it and not knowing what they're looking at or looking for. Not saying Kyle doesn't, but saying a lot of people do, and then they come into the dive shop, and that's where the dive shops get a little bit can get frustrated. And like Jamesy said, that they should be charging for their time and fees. But to be able to do that with a smile on their face becomes a little bit of a challenge, especially as Joseph said, during COVID, when you're trying to pay your bills and you can't um, for whatever reason. It, it becomes very challenging when you are trying to figure out how to pay your bills and somebody comes in and says, hey, I bought this on Dive Gear Express. Um, and you're like, I our fees probably were less like you besides taxes or whatever depends on what state you live in but you know it it becomes a challenge well that's part of the economies of scale right where dive yeah. gear express has the ability to cut hundred thousand dollar po's to get premium pricing but yep. when the car dealership model has said i need a ford chevy and dodge dealership right up the street and we say well, I need an Aqualung, a Scuba Pro, and a Hewish dealership, bam, bam, bam. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, the $100,000 is now split between three different shops, three different equipment manufacturers, and all the training split between three different training agencies. And that collapse of the industry would actually allow some of these shops to be profitable and successful because they're not fighting for every last dollar when the pool gets smaller every year. Yeah. Yeah, it becomes it's it's a very big challenge for that whole entire thing. I mean, I, I don't have an answer for it, so I don't really know. Uh what's the ego thing going on? I see background, I see people talking about egos and is there something I missed? Uh, is it so dash up ego? Comment about um getting a panel for dive shop owners um yeah. so they could share knowledge. I mean, essentially what you're doing now, Jason, with at least one dive shop owner. But uh, the comment from Brock was you'd need a big doorway to fit the egos of the ah, dive shop. Gotcha. Owners. I missed that one completely. Oh, there it is. I see it now. There he is. Uh, boom. Yeah, we would need a big doorway. We could put a double wide in for Joseph. Be used to that. You don't need a, do you don't need a doorway, brother. You need a... Uh, tri triple yeah. comes next yeah, and quadruple. Uh, I know how you are down in Georgia. Let's one, two, three, four, quadruple. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, we have solved almost nothing at this point in time. Um, but I think we had a lot of really, really good conversations <laughs> overall. Uh, lots of opinions. I mean, I, I think that what it comes down to is – 
that we need to, as a group in general, be working together and kind of identifying areas where we can grow. And no one's ever going to agree in at all with this whole thing. Um, but the idea that we're having conversation, go ahead, Mayor. But don't be a dick. Oh, I've got a big problem with that. I don't know if I can do that <laughs> or not. That's I try, but there's medication work now, well. Jason. It's okay. It's <laughs> yeah, I got it. It's, it's called it's whiskey. Med. That's that's how I so I've overcome that whole thing is I just drink whiskey instead. So um, I know, you better start swimming. Yeah, you're gonna lose every swim test. Look at you, look at me. All right, so um <laughs> <That's my laughs> words, <man>. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Joseph, closing arguments or closing words, anything you want to say before we are done tonight? Not uh, all dive shots are dinosaurs. Well put. Straight in, straight into the point. Well done. All right, Eric, any closing comments or things you want to say? Uh, I got I got nothing. It's just, just scary. scary. It's just scary. <laughs> it's scary. Tom, I know you got something to say. <laughs> While I, while I feel for those that have suffered and have had to close their shops, I'll say good riddance to bad rubbish. And I hope that those that have not been left as dinosaurs and have chosen to make the right decisions and move forward only succeed. And that's all I got. Good I, riddance I think to bad rubbish. I think that's a very good point of look for those individuals that because of the way everything's going right. And, and because of COVID and coronavirus and, and the way that the industry has been affected and, and the economy in general, um, when you're looking at the dive shops that you really truly respect in some way, shape or form, do something to help them out. Especially at this point in time, we were looking, Joseph was making comments about the, uh, what was it? Uh, dive business. So uh, yeah, the, yeah. yeah, the dive center, yeah, the dive center business. I called. Uh, they they just came out with the COVID October uh, results, and I was just reading the comments, and I and I, it, it, it's sad, and I wasn't laughing by no means, but I was just like, wow, like, and I called Jason, and I, I said, have you seen this shit? Like, it's yeah. just some of the things that it have they have said in there. It's it's uh, and that's just the people that chose to respond. So yeah, that, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's it's going to be an interesting outlook coming through because we got to make it through winter. So uh, we need to we need to adapt to this entire situation. We need to grow. And the people that are doing that um, need your uh, support as divers. And um, I'm not sure how many people we reach. I guess we got 50,000 people last time and 7000 views or something like that. So not sure how far this is reaching out. But if you can support some sort of a local dive shop or some sort of a company that's doing the right thing, please do so. Uh, Mayor. Sorry to kind of cut you, go in between yeah. you two. So. so I would say is know what your clients need. Know what you and your staff do well. Keep working to serve your clients better. Do what you do good, even better. <laughs> Who cares what the trends are? Fuck the trends. I love it. Maybe a different letter on that last four letter word. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. No. See, that's how you do it, Tom. That's After how you do it. Three. <laughs> Kevin, I I would just say keep at it what you're doing here and and spreading the word and and having these kind of the podcasts and the calls and and getting out there and being an ambassador for the community and then that way you know Tom says let the industry collapse that will make the industry change eventually over time yeah. because they they learn from I mean I learn from these people I respect these people. And they are the people that I would ask questions to before I would just take an answer from somewhere else. So um, just keep at it with what you're doing. Does that include drinking whiskey? Of course. Okay, good. As long as that is because, part of it, I love it. Because, you know, abs are cool, but have you tried beer? <laughs> <laughs> have you tried Miller Lite, Jason? No, I don't drink piss water. Screw that shit. I work for Anheuser-Busch anyway, so I wouldn't even drink Miller. I'd drink Bud Light if I did. So. You're an IPA guy, aren't you, Jason? I am an IPA guy. Oh. Might as well call me emo. Oh, Jesus. Oh, I like hoppy uh, ass shit. I like hoppy. Uh, you got to come to New England then. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. There's a lot of good. I've got to get out there. I've been trying to get out scalloping, so I got to come out. Come so. on. Back. Oh, oh, wait. Before we leave, somebody has a very good. Oh, not that. This <laughs> dive shops. Dive <laughs> shops need to carry bigger calf knives. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Christmas so. tree. Go behave. Uh, 
Christmas <laughs> trees. Christmas they trees. Bring back the BFKs. Yeah. So, yeah. I want the BCDs that light up. I want those. Oh, yeah. The BCDs. Oh, the, oh yeah. The excess scuba ones. Yeah. I want the excess scuba yeah. BCDs. Don't give Joe Couture a bigger knife. He'll just stab more people with it. <laughs> nice. All <laughs> right. I'm going to pull you guys out and say goodbye to all the people, and then we'll go from there. But thank you very much, guys. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. All right. Thank you. Cheers, mates. Thank you. Cheers. 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 All right, guys. Thank you very much for tuning in. Lots of good conversation. Um, we will jump in there. Uh, Bill Bigelow, as much as Tom disagrees with that upgrade, I agree with the upgrade. I do very, very well with it. Um, so, uh, like we said, we didn't really accomplish too much, but we had a nice, great conversation. Uh, we might revisit this topic later on, uh, maybe with some repeats or some new faces in there. Uh, excellent, excellent, excellent conversation. Thank you very much for everything. We're going to go through the comments uh, tonight or tomorrow. Like I said, we are going to be joining up with a podcast pretty soon, uh, trying to finalize all that. I got to download all the parts, uh, but we can go ahead and like and follow on YouTube. It's going to be right over here, right in this general vicinity somewhere uh, during this presentation. And as always, we appreciate anything you can do in the Patreon area to kind of help support us going further. Uh, we're going to have some pretty big news coming forward, hopefully in the very near future. So uh, thank you very much and have a wonderful night. Uh, we will see you in about two weeks for the female conversation on how to keep females in the industry, how to encourage them and make sure that they feel welcomed in this semi yeah, completely male centric sport that we need to fix that um joseph needs to uh see some more ladies i believe so uh so have a wonderful night thank you cheers guys <laughs>